Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. This is Shaco Sessions Live. It's a weekly live video streaming concert series promoting Richmond's vibrant music scene and rejuvenating your soul with live music from the comfort of your own home. Ultimate Cycle. For over 50 years, one of the nation's leading ATV, UTV, and cycle showroom and repair service centers in the heart of Powhatan County. Visit ultimatecycle.net. DVG, an industry-leading supplier and system integrator of broadcast and production systems, serving customers internationally with leading manufacturers in broadcast and television. Visit digitalvideogroup.com. In Your Ear Studios, the Mid-Atlantic's premier recording, video streaming, and post-production studio in Richmond's historic Shaco Bottom. Visit inyourear.com. Shaco Records, a Richmond-based music label developing and empowering Virginia's musical artists and the RVA creative arts community. Visit shacorecords.com. Good evening, music lovers, and thank you for tuning in to Shaco Sessions Live, presented by Shaco Records. We are live from In Your Ears, poetic and thought-provoking Studio A. You may notice that tonight things look a little bit different. Your usual host, the lovely... Queen Reese is unfortunately under the weather, and if that wasn't sad enough, no Reese means no, Re no Rosie, so we don't have a cute dog, and it gets even worse. They're making me host tonight, so <laughs> hang on tight. Now, if you want to hang on tight to a black folding chair, you should get your butt on over to ShacoSessionsLive.com and grab a ticket so you can come down here to the studio and enjoy the music live. There's a beautiful community here, and it would mean a lot to have you here, too. On tonight's show, we have Douglas Powell, but you might know him as Roscoe Burnham's, a Richmond, Virginia native. He is a spoken word artist, educator, comedic entertainer, former TEDx speaker, and multi-poetry -po slam champion, and Richmond's first poet laureate. Roscoe has dedicated his career to using spoken word as a therapeutic process and showing others how to do the same. His one-hour poetry and comedy special, Tromedy, is currently streaming on Amazon Prime, Tubi, and other platforms. Thank you. I feel like I should have my NPR voice on. <laughs> Welcome to Studio 1A. <laughs> What's good, y'all? That is not the vibe tonight, <laughs> I promise you. That is not. I am loud, I'm from the South, with an F. I'm gonna be giving you like prolific poems and dumbass jokes <laughs> throughout the entire night. We were already cutting up over here, Marcus and I. Y'all show some love for Marcus Ishad. Helping me out tonight. <laughs> My mans was like, if you wanna grab a black folding chair, we were like, what? Grab a black. It's like, what did that white man say? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch that pacing, fam. <laughs> it's like, you wanna grab a black? I was like, grab a black folding chair. I was like, oh, oh okay, well, that's different. That's, that's not what I thought you were gonna say. You feeling good? Make some noise, make some noise, make some noise. I'm gonna be this stupid in between poems the entire night. I'm letting you know that now. Uh, but <laughs> glad somebody, one person's really excited about that. <laughs> and everybody else is like, ah, okay. Anybody, so, so who's, who's like new to, to me? Like you've never seen me before. Oh, okay, all right. You're in for, I don't know if I'm gonna call it a treat, but you're in for something. Um, I appreciate you coming out on a Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like we're out here, like, and the weather was pretty good. So it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? But this is like a, Nice little <clears throat> mature crowd, so I know it's like inching close to your bedtime. So we'll try to, we'll try to, some people are like, yeah, well, <laughs> if, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Uh, so we won't keep you out, we won't keep you out too late. All right, I know y'all got work in the morning, you know what I mean? Good, you know, saying good hard working folk. Um, although some of y'all probably are already prepared to call in. You were already prepared to call in before you got here. Some of y'all are my kind of people. You were coughing before you left the job, just to give them a heads up. You see each other on the way to the parking lot, and you're like, 
Oh, Lord willing, I'll see y'all tomorrow. <laughs> Stay. You got you to pre-lie. All right? Love a good pre-lie. Uh, anybody work like a regular like nine to five? Like, yeah? Like a clock in, clock out kind of, kind of thing? All right. Okay. Y'all were like, oh. Yeah. All right. Don't bring it up. I also like how the one kid in here was like, yeah, me too. Uh, working that night shift. You know what I mean? <laughs> Drinking coffee and taking no dos. And, you know. <laughs> Any business owners? Any like entrepreneurs? Okay. All right. You can, you can, it's, you know, it's not a survey. You can just be like, you know, you can like clap your hands. Be, okay. All right. All right. So y'all work every job. You got like seven jobs. You're an entrepreneur. You got like seven jobs. Right? That's what they don't tell you when you start your own business. Right? Is you're everything. You're, the, you're social media, you're marketing, advertising, you are the janitor, you are all of it. Um, so my thing is that we get kind of caught up in this, in this grind, right? And, it's, and it's, I think it's stupid. That's why I think that it's really, really fucking stupid. Because we could have had anything. Like, you gotta, you gotta think, everything that we see around us is, is created by humans, right? The buildings that we, we enter into, like how we get to and from, the institutions that we believe in, the forms of government, it's all, it's all created by humans. And it is proof, all these things are proof that we are fucking stupid. Because <laughs> we could have had anything. We could have had absolutely anything when creating all the things, right? And so we could have kept it simple. We could have all been on the beach right now, smoking weed, eating fruit and fucking, right? That could have been life. That could have been life right now. But no, we chose five day work weeks and student loans. What the fuck is this? She, 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 I like how she didn't laugh. She was just like, damn, you right. Damn, I ain't never thought about it like that. <laughs> but we get into how we, caught, we got caught in the grind and we all believed in it and we all bought into it and here we are fucking grinding and calling in sick on a, on a Wednesday morning. <laughs> so the routine goes, we wake up, eat, go to work, eat, go back to work, go home, eat, go to sleep. That sound familiar to anybody? Yeah? Work, eat, work, home, sleep. Work, eat, work, home. That's got a little, got a little bop to it, don't it? Like, like, work, eat, work, home, sleep. Hey, 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 work, eat, work, home, sleep. Shoot. Now all we need is little baby on the track and get Marcus Ishad on the beat. And don't it make for the perfect trap song? Like if the caged bird sings, well, then the mouse must freestyle. About stacking cheese, stacking bread to get ahead. What I mean is I'm in a rat race on a hamster wheel. Like, no matter how far I think I'm going, or no matter if I'm trying my hardest, seems like I end up right back where the fuck I started. Trying to make ends meet in a circle of poverty. And the pie graph says I'm middle class. But when I look at the radius, I only find myself in the middle of a midlife crisis, middle of an existential crisis, middle of my depression, middle of a goddamn panic attack. I can't even finish this poem. I gotta go back to... Work, eat, work, home, sleep. Hey, 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 side note. Why do the ends always have to meet? I mean, we've done this before. I mean, we pay these bills like every week. I mean, haven't the ends met already? Why did they leave each other? I mean, I mean, don't they need each other? And then why do I have to be the one to introduce these motherfuckers to each other? I'm in this bitch like, cash, this is debt. And debt, this is cash. Cash is the one who bandages my scars when debt be kicking my ass. Kicking my ass, but I'm the one punching the clock. So much I feel like a boxer or feeling boxed in. I mean, I mean, my cubicle, my cubicle's kind of shaped like a box. My desk, my desk is kind of shaped like a box. My computer, my computer's kind of shaped like a box. So I'm clicking on the box and I'm typing on the box and I'm staring at the box and I go home, I don't feel like cooking, so I'm taking a TV dinner out the box. Then I gotta go to my warehouse job where I stack boxes onto a box and we do this until we end up in a pine box. Time is money and this job is costing me a lot. But America claimed land of the free, then sold us a dream just to find out America be the biggest pyramid scheme. 
where the working class are told to pull themselves from rock bottom up, but when you got an entire society stacked on top of you, it's hard to even exercise your rights, let alone pull up nowadays. I wanna, I wanna hang myself with these goddamn bootstraps, but can't think like that, I gotta go back to work. Eat, work, home, sleep, work, eat, sleep, fall asleep at work. And the cycle, the song, just plays on repeat until you fade out. Work, eat, work, home, sleep. Ay, work, eat, work, home, sleep. Ay, work, eat, work, home, sleep. Ay, work, eat, work, home, sleep. Y'all definitely calling in tomorrow now. <laughs> so I, uh, I've worked a lot of jobs, uh, a lot of jobs. So my thing has always been like, uh, I always have a job, it's just never the same job. <laughs> it's always something new. <laughs> always kind of bouncing around a little bit. I actually learned that from my mom. My mom kept a job. It was just never the same job. <laughs> it was always, it was always something different. My mom was magic. My mom would leave, my mom would leave as a receptionist and come back as a construction worker. I'm like, how the hell did you even do that? <laughs> did you get fired and hired in the same day? You left in a skirt and heels. You came back in Tim's and a hard hat. What the fuck? What is going on? Um, but she never stopped. She did whatever she had to do to raise her boys. Um, and it's like drastically affected like, uh, like how I view everything now, how I view life and parenting and work. Uh, I think it's really one of the reasons why I'm, a, I've, I'm decided to be like a full-time artist. I was like, I didn't want to get caught up in just clocking in and clocking out and, and feeling like I'm just, I'm just doing something to make somebody else rich, uh, or make, a, you know, make some other entity, this faceless corporation rich. Um, when I have so many other passions and desires. One thing I, I, I regret about my mom's life is that she had all these like dreams that she never uh, got a chance to fulfill because she was just so busy kind of caught, uh, caught up in the rat race. Um, and life is short, right? Like you get, you know, like you get what, 80, 90 years if we're lucky, a little longer. It's, it's a blip in the, in, the, in the larger grand scheme of things. And so you have to do what you love. You have to love what you do. You have to just appreciate every moment that you get because you don't know if you're going to get another moment, right? Um, my mom was, a, it was absolutely amazing. Um, and I was raised by a single mom. Anybody was, ra anybody was raised by a single mom? Okay, a couple, few of us. All right, you know what I'm saying? No, the, no daddy's club. All right, I'm going to start a little support group after this. <laughs> I see you. I see you. I see you. Being raised by a single mom is tough because single moms don't take no shit. They can't. They're pulling double duty, right? They don't have no time to give you no grace. There's no grace, all right? I didn't know this. Nobody told me this. There was no manual. There's no handbook on, the, on, on being raised by single moms. I say that to say, the first and the last time that I cussed at my mother, Look at all the black people laughing. I can't stand. Anytime I tell this story, I can't stand it. Black people start laughing immediately. Ha! <laughs> I already know how this went down. The white people still look confused. They're like, oh, what you mean? The last time? <laughs> really? I cussed at Karen yesterday. <laughs> there are like three people who didn't find that joke funny. They're sitting right in the middle. <laughs> sitting right, like sitting right in eye shot of me. First and last time I cussed at my mother, I was about 16 years old, right? We were arguing, which was my first mistake. And I yell from the kitchen all the way down the hall to the left up the stairs, which was my, mother's room, my mother's room. That's kind of important to the story. I yell out, you know, sometimes you can be so damn petty. <laughs> they know how this ends. <laughs> So I yell out, you know, sometimes you could be so damn petty. And I turn around, feeling accomplished, parched, 
I'm gonna get myself some water. <laughs> and then like a, like a chill kind of came over the air. <laughs> Full horror movie, just shh, 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 shh. <laughs> and in seconds, in seconds, sir, my mother was already in, in the doorway, all the way from up the stairs, around the corner, down the hall, just appeared in like a cloud of smoke. <laughs> Hashtag black girl magic. <laughs> and did that thing that parents do that I really hated then that I do to my own kids now. She kind of leans in a little bit and she was like, What'd you just say? <laughs> but I'm not dumb enough to say it again. So for context, my mother was born and raised, survived and thrived from Mosby Court. Look at the, I had you, look at the, that. <laughs> I hate it when the black people laugh at this, it, like they, because they know the thing, they know the things that are about to happen and they also know exactly where Mosby be Court is and what Mosby Court is about. <laughs> My mom was born and raised, survived and thrived from Mosby Court, all right? Mosby Court, for those who are unfamiliar, <laughs> it's one of the toughest hoods in Richmond, Virginia, right? Grass refuses to grow in Mosby Court. It's scared. It's scared to be there. <laughs> Knowing this information, I go up to protect my face. And my mother sees this as a sign of attack. <laughs> and in one fluid motion, my mother grabs me, pulls me in, and for my WWE fans, suplexes me out of the kitchen and into the dining room and through the piano bench that was next to us. When I woke up, <laughs> I had graduated, so that was cool. And my mother is up there hovering over me talking about, so who the hell is Petty, because she don't live here. Eh, clap for my mama and child abuse. Clap for my mama and child abuse. It's fantastic. It wasn't child abuse then, that was good parenting. That was, all right, this is the early 2000s. You can still put, you can, you can still put a kid through a table, no consequences. They're gonna call the peoples on you now. You, could, you put a kid through a table now, that's, you know what I mean? They got numbers. They got numbers for that now. I love my mom. Uh, my mom passed uh, at the end of 2021 uh, after a long fought battle with cancer. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, the honesty of it is that it's been rough. And um, just watching her kind of wither away. And uh, I didn't really know how to process that. I'm still trying to figure out how to process that. But grief is a tricky, a tricky thing. Um, that uh, doesn't really have like a, an end, you know what I mean? Um, you just kind of, you take it day by day. Uh, and it's just weird, just in general, just watching your relationship with your parents change over time. You know what I mean? This is a person who raised me uh, and, and ushered me into adulthood. And, uh, and the tables turn, and I'm taking care of her. I just want to give her one more day. And at time, before her kidneys quit, before her thyroid collapsed, before, her, before stress punched her in the eyes and slowed that disco in her chest down to a death march, gift her an appreciation for what life has made her. I want to see a smile that doesn't have her past in it. I gaze in rose-colored nostalgia. She sees a cracking wall of the bombshell she used to be. I still see remnants of explosions in her eyes. When I was a boy, her arms were like shopping carts. She would load groceries enough to fill tummies, and sometimes I'd ride inside her biceps is where I felt the safest. Her knuckles told me stories. I would fall asleep, thumbing through pages of scuffles she never wanted to mention, read a few footprints on her neck, blood on her teeth, half beauty, half beast, all bite. My mother never barked. She said, barking, she said barking is an empty threat, plus it implies that you are a bitch. Not this elegant seamstress who discovered the chic and draping uncertainties, five feet nine inches of fuck you, I'm fierce, disguised everything that she didn't want noticed, needled all her worn emotions into steel garments to protect herself from men like her father, womenizers, alcoholics, 
abusers, men with egos like thread, the fabric of time. It showed her disdain. She wove morals into everything she made my brother and me. I watched her cut a lot of people loose, but stay stitched to her resentment, made her this glowing crimson sienna. My mother was the most beautiful shade of bitter. She is, old, she is older. It's a rust color now. She walks to the mailbox like she won't make it back. Her blood used to rush like it was late for work. Now it barely gets her out of bed. She's got a smile like a tattered flag still waving past posture like an old rocking chair makes her voice a raspy sway her heart was literally two sizes too big it don't have the same bump like it used to when i lean against her chest i can still hear earth wind and fire and parliament funkadelic in every beat her generosity was immeasurable she gives because she never got never had a husband a boyfriend a man to pull his own weight or a dad and still managed to raise gods rosa may a single mother a workaholic, a sage, but believed in herself the way she believes in happy endings, has learned, that, has learned from firsthand experience that you can't trust people by as far as you can shoot them, has had every dream crushed under the heel of someone who just didn't love her enough and it taught her to treat her reflection the same. Now, I've pleaded for her to embrace the beauty of a scarred yesteryear and she often responds that it's too late. The echoes of worthless have rang throughout her conscience for too long. She is what happens, y'all, when perfection gets dragged through the mud. My mother wasn't just any woman. She was every woman. She was Whitney Houston, Shaka Khan, Wonder Woman. My mother was more woman than any man was ready for. And more man than any of the ones that came in and out of her life. My mother, my mother has a heart full of batteries. An act of mourning leaves her drained, leaves her out of breath. She stays plugged into the bed through most of the afternoon, recharging most days. It takes all evening. She uses these moments. She used these moments to read scripture and talk to Jesus. My mother owed her life to her faith, but often asked me to take her to church on Sundays. She, would, she remembered all the times she's died. When resurrection had been a defibrillator laying hands on her, she thanks God for all the transformations, never the doctor's. You know, I had recently uh, re watched something about how often religious text gets doctored, how holy books undergo transformations. And I read a lot about scripture. Found there were 14,800 differences between the original Bible and its most modern version. That there was no mention of Christ's return in its earliest rendition. That the similarities between Christianity and Egyptology is uncanny. And most religious holidays linked to Christ are pagan and have nothing to do with Christ at all. After all this, I became agnostic not atheist. I didn't choose to believe in nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that. I just chose to stop looking through the pigeonhole that is religion. Felt a huge word like God was too big to put in a chapter book. I use terms like the universe now. I don't really pray as much as I meditate, and I, I figured if Jesus, Muhammad, and Moses didn't need a Bible, Quran, or Torah, then maybe I should follow suit. Now, at one point, I thought I had to educate my mother on everything that I had learned, right? Truth about King James, religious fear-mongering, the origin of Satan, and since then, <clears throat> Uh, she had stopped asking me to take her to Sunday service. <laughs> Go figure. Said that she's praying for me. Never really specifies what she's hoping is going to happen. She thinks I'm an atheist. She had never heard the word agnostic. And I was starting to think there were 14,800 differences between my mother and me. When the surgeon said there was no mention of her return, I responded like scripture, O oh, ye of little faith, realize the similarities between her and I are uncanny. There's a little bit of gospel I have inside has nothing to do with Christ at all. It was after watching cardiac arrest leave her chest split like a red sea after cancer had been a nail in our, in our family's palm and every man in her life be one Judas after another. These things made me doubt the Lord, but overcoming them made her believe in God more. Maybe she's blind. Maybe I'm blind. Maybe faith is about being blind and, and trusting everything you feel. She calls it God. I call it the universe. She found it in a book, and I found it in her. Look, I've learned too much about the Bible to always believe in it. She had gone through too much in life not to. My mother passed down the same Bible. She swears kept her alive, and I'm going to read it all the way through one day when they add a book about my mother. I am agnostic, not atheist. There are times I've learned too much to believe in God, but I've watched my mother be God too much not to believe in something. Word. We feeling good? Say word. 
And so listen, look, we're not like in a library. I like, I'm, you know what I mean? I made the NPR joke, but y'all can, y'all can relax your shoulders a little bit. You know what I mean? And so in, in spoken word culture, like, so it's an interactive experience, right? So if you hear things uh, that move you in some way, there, there are reactions that you can have, right? So the classic one is, is the Love Jones poetry snaps. Let me, see your, let me see your poetry snaps. Okay, your little Love Jones poetry snaps, even though I hate that damn movie. Um, I love that we're recording this so I can, ha I can be on record as saying I fucking hate Love Jones, <laughs> all right? Uh, but then of course you say, and then you can do it, you can, you can, like, you can respond uh, verbally, you hear a line that, that kind of moves you or hits you or that's a bar or whatever, you can ooh, let me hear ooh. You can ah, you can mm. And then, you know, whatever else you would do in like a black Baptist church. So you can like stomp your feet, you can wave your hands, you can run around, there's not a lot of space. You, you can, come on now, somebody, you didn't know you came for a word. You didn't know you came for a word this morning. That is my least favorite thing that pastors would say. Pastors would be like, you didn't know you came for a word this morning. I did. I'm in church. I came here deliberately. I know I came for a word this morning. My other least favorite thing said in church is take your time, pastor. No, 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 no. It's Sunday, all right? It's fall. We all want to see the game. Do not take your time, Pastor. Actually, if you could give us the abridged version, <laughs> if you could just give us notes we could take home, <laughs> we could, and we could just kind of wrap this up so we can go get that church chicken and then head back to the house. That's how you, that's how you know people who grew up in the, in the Baptist church, that, that, you know what I'm saying, that down-home Baptist church, that one-room sanctuary with the kerosene heater in the middle of the junk. You know what I'm saying? Come on now. <laughs> Go down in that church basement and get that same damn chicken every Sunday and them overcooked green beans. Green beans. Them green beans be gray as hell by the time they finally get them things. <laughs> Drenched in salt. <laughs> Just knew we was eating healthy. <laughs> God damn. So yeah, so any of those reactions are acceptable. Uh, like I said, you can run around, you can run around the sanctuary if you want to. Now listen, two things. One, you pass out from running around like they do in church. We ain't got none of them little blankets to throw on you. Okay? We ain't got none of them little church blankets. All right, we ain't got none. So if you if you ain't got like no drawers on, nothing like that, your business is gonna be out. You know what I mean? And there's cameras, there's cameras all around here. So just think wisely. Think before you act. Think before you act. Also, if you go around running around here because you feel it, because the spirit done moved you or whatever, if you're not going over these, if you knock over these cameras, I can't help you. All right. I ain't got no insurance. I ain't got no money. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's on you. That's between you and your God and Shaco Sessions. <laughs> you figure out, y'all figure out the payment plan when you knock these damn cameras over. I have a weird relationship with, with <laughs> fix your face, Jasmine. <laughs> Watching my best friend silently judge me. <laughs> I have, I have, I have a, uh, an interesting relationship with God because like, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a person who doesn't believe in something like bigger than myself. I just don't really know what to call that all the time. And then I'm also like, I'm not a, I'm not a place in my life where I don't feel the need to really call it anything, right? Whatever it is, is whatever it is. Um, and I've learned that it, everyone's gonna call it a little something different. Um, and I don't give a fuck. Like, <laughs> I don't really give a fuck what you call it. Be, re be real with you. Um, you know what I mean? Like, how is it, how is it, uh, how is it shaped your, your, your human experience is really what it, what matters to me, right? Are you out being a good person? Uh, are you doing good things? Are you, are you showing empathy and love and care, uh, and understanding? Um, cause those are supposed to be the, the, the foundation, right? It's supposed to be the principles of, of the, of the, you know, whatever higher power uh, that you serve. So I don't really care what you call it uh, as long as, you know, it's, it's got you uh, behaving in a way that, that betters humanity in some way. Um, but I left, I left religion a, like a long time ago. Um, and, and I still get the question, especially after performing. People are like, oh, what church do you go to? And I always kind of respond like I, like I graduated. I'd be like, oh, me? No, class of 04. I ain't been back since. <laughs> no, thank you. No, no, I'm fine. I read the book. I was fine. I'm <laughs> Um, I have a hard time. I got to be honest. It's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes, like, believing in this, like, as far as Christianity will have you believe, right, this kind of person that's, like, hovering above you, making all these decisions, um, particularly when you look at history and you look at humans. <laughs> I have a hard time believing in God the more I look at humans. 
because humans suck. <laughs> you start looking at, you know, the history of humans, and you're like, so you mean to tell me God just took like a, like a little 400-year nap? Like what? There's like a little window between, I don't know, 1619 and I don't know, 2023, where I just feel like you might be missing a little. I'm sure there's some prayers that you haven't really answered yet. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> It's hard. Like it's, when you're black, it's, sometimes when you look at history, you're like, all right, something's up. <laughs> something's, something's awry here. It's tough. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's interesting because I feel like some of the most like, devout believers that I've ever met have been uh, primarily like older black people. They're they are like very, they hold tight to their faith. Um, and there's something beautiful about that, right? Because that, that, that faith gets you through all the hard times, right? Knowing or thinking or believing that something else is coming, something else better is going to happen, even if it isn't in this lifetime. Something else is going to, to be better than this. And so you're enduring uh, and you're, you're, you're uh, processing through all this, you know, these long suffering, uh, in order to get to this, like, better space, this better something that comes after this. And it's, it's, I think it's interesting. Um, yeah. Um, but as a result, we still like, experience, like, all this, like, kind of pain and trauma, and it works its way into everything else, right? It was worked its way into our faith. All the gospel songs and the blues... Don't clap for that. Don't you clap for that. Don't you, cl don't you clap for that as a sign. What was he short on lightning? What was like, what? He's like, I ain't got no more. I ain't got, I ain't got no more. He's like, I ain't got, he's, he's talking shit. But I ain't got no more damn lightning. Jesus, you know where I put my, my extra lightning? Let me just go ahead and fuck these lights up real quick. That's not a, that's, that's not a sign. <laughs> that's not a sign. <laughs> <laughs> can't stand you, can't stand y'all. As <laughs> soon, soon as the lights drop, you was like, you believe now? No! No, I don't. I need something a little bigger. I need something a little bigger than that. <laughs> now they're just fucking with me. <laughs> Our faith is, has shown up in, in so many ways and in, 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 um, in all the pain that we've endured as a culture. You know what I mean? We, uh, we've, had, we've held on to all this resilience. Um, and it's, it's made its way into our, our livelihood, our conversations, um, our art. It shows up that way all the time, um, particularly in, like, in our art and our music. Um, the music that historically has come from like black and brown people have been like drenched in, in suffering in some way. Even the gospel songs, right? The gospel songs are always like this, all the hardships you gotta, you know what I mean? Like uh, that you have to endure in order to get to the, this promised land or whatever. Um, white people, what do y'all, what do y'all church songs sound like? Now that I think about it, like, <laughs> this wasn't even a part of the set. I was just kind of curious now. I was like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I think about, I think about Negro spirituals, and I'm like, oh, this pain is in Negro spirituals. You think Amazing Grace? He saved a wretch like me. Do y'all just have like happy ass like church songs? Are there just are y'all just church songs just really really happy? No. See, yes, yeah. What's, what? Uh, there you go. It's a lot, a whole lot of. See, we're going to the wrong churches. <laughs> We was going to the whole this whole time. We should, we should have just went to just a happy ass church. We should have just been kicking it with them. <laughs> Singing Amazing Grace 50 times in church. That was a little bit sad. I got ADHD. Don't remind me. I, just, I, just, I will go down a whole little tangent. It's just me being honest. I'm going to get back to the set, Marcus. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> Marcus is like, <laughs> listen, I'm paid by the hour. It's worked its way into our art, um, and I think there's something beautiful about that. 
uh, even though um, it comes from a place of, plan of, of pain. Say a word. Um, let's, uh, let's do the drum poem. Produced by Marcus Ishad. Shout some love for Marcus. When jazz singer Ma Rainey said, white folks to the blues come out, but they don't know how it got there. I present to you a timeline of history and music. We went from drum call to call for freedom, from plucking on banjos to bondage on a ship, from djembes to Django. We are survivors, and here we are crashed like symbols on the soil of tobacco, cotton, sharecropping fingers, fingers, coarse like their hair, coarse like the lashes on their back, coarse like their pain, harmonized in the key of trauma, or traumatized to the harm of being a minor or being a minority looking for the freedom notes. The slave song rebellion anthem mapping north like a union soldier's bugle singing a Negro spiritual and the same fingers. The same fingers that have been clutching the necks of blues and folk guitars were the same fingers, plucking tear-soaked ropes from their necks who but us could unravel a noose and turn it into an instrument. Go through hell and then make gospel like fire, shut up in the bones of a burning cross and then baptize ourselves in a colored fountain. I mean, who but the Negro could fry up a Jim Crow and then feed a nation revolution? to the symphony of the Iron Hand bigot called America, the pop of gunshots or police batons like snares, snared justice in the teeth of police dogs who but colored folk could find rhythm in a riot, make a Motown out of a march, put up a funk to five soul fist for freedom, and then when the soul need a break beat, we bass boom, crack walls, crack glass ceilings, even when crack babies are getting born in a concrete existence, we pump up the volume, pump up the volume and the veins. Who but blacks could use needles to spin back the hands of time and scratch the surface of a broken history? Who but descendants of the enslaved? Now only slaves to a rhythm could take centuries full of suffering and make genres full of joy and rising sounds that sound like black notes on a white page and they want to know how it got there. We've always taken all the off key that we've been given and made a resilient medley and they want to hit the notes. They want to silence the notes. They want to dead the notes, but it is said that you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. But when you were children of the drum, people can stop the heart, but they'll never stop the beat. I know it's like kind of a little on the nose for the black poet to talk about black shit. <laughs> but you have to. Yeah. You got to talk about the black shit. Because who else is going to do it? Um, also, stop giving us stuff to talk about. <laughs> Because I'd like to. I'd like to just talk about regular shit. Just regular ass shit. I'd, I'd like my poems just to be regular. Um, but it's hard, right? Because you got you to talk about the things that exist um, when, you're, when you're the population that's enduring those things. Uh, and I know that when we, when we talk about how the experiences are so different when we're all living in the same space, it's a little awkward sometimes. It's uncomfortable. Um, but if we don't have the uncomfortable conversations, then we won't figure out a way to fix it, um, if there is a fix. And the ability to ignore it or not talk about it is the privilege. I know that's like a scary word. It's like, oh, here we go, privilege. But privilege exists, right? There are different types of privileges, right, that we all kind of benefit from. Right? I have male privilege, right? So that's my example I always give. I have male privilege. There are things that I never have to consider 
when I walk out of the house that like my homies that are women or women identifying have to consider every time they walk out the door, right? All the dangers that exist for them when, for how they show up in the world that don't necessarily exist for me, right? So it's not uh, reduced to just gender, right? That happens with race and a, a myriad of other things. And so we have to talk about what privileges we have um, and then how we can make people who are suffering, right? How we can make their lives a little easier uh, and, and start to create some real equity, right? Um, but it's difficult if people don't want to have those conversations uh, because it makes people uncomfortable. But you've got to be uncomfortable sometimes. You have to be. So I say it to say, this next poem is going to make y'all really uncomfortable, white people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I ain't really know no other way to like, kind of ease into that. You know what I mean? But, you know, but the poem's about, shoot, the poem's about three minutes long. So you're just going to have to be a little antsy. You have to be just a little antsy for about, about, about two minutes and 48 seconds. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Metaphysics 101 for white privilege. Okay, so like if a tree falls in the forest and the people in the forest claim not to hear it, did it make a sound? What if the tree was rosewood burning? What if the tree were planted right in the middle of Tulsa, Oklahoma? What if the tree were this dark shade of brown? Would it matter then? Or, or are you one of those all trees matter kind of people? <laughs> what if the tree didn't just fall? What if the tree were chopped down? What if the ax was targeting that tree? What if that tree only made up about 13% of the forest, but for some reason made up about 85% of the caskets? What if that tree had both of its branches stretched like the first day of spring? What if that tree was shivering like it was the middle of winter? What if that tree tried to comply and still died? Is this death still a death? Is death a death when no one recognizes the life? Metaphysics is a broad philosophy full of questions. Challenges what we think is real. How things can be both seen and unseen at once, like sound, like breath, like God, like death, like people of color in America. And the nature of being, that is the perennial topic in metaphysics. And when discussing race poses a question that only white people get to ask themselves in this country, what does it mean to be? And that is privilege. The ability to question and then decide. The ability to tell. Because people of color in America are often told what to be. Be cargo be commodity, be cash crop, be free, but this water fountain free, be this side of the border, be labeled under attack, underfunded, underrepresented, but overwhelmed, be affirmative action. They swear, they swear that you got it by affirmative action and then still took away affirmative action. <laughs> but historically, Affirmative action has helped more white women than any other demographic, so really it's um, be just enough to make a campus look diverse. Be hired. Be just enough to make an office look diverse. Be voting when they need you and voting when it's convenient and when they, when they, when they don't. When they don't, be gerrymandered out of a voice. Be, be quiet. Because if it doesn't make a sound, well then it doesn't exist. This country is full of white noise, all static and erasure. And just because you didn't create the interference doesn't mean you don't benefit from it. But you can't make the struggle in my skin a theory. We are not a hypothesis. We are absolute. We are an axiom, an undeniable truth. And the truth is, it isn't always MAGA hats and white sheets that is our plight. You know, sometimes it'd be the people standing idly by, pretending they don't hear us fall. You said you were uncomfortable? You were uncomfortable too? Damn. All, all discomfort matters. I 
hate humans, but I love humanity. I don't know if that makes sense, but it sounds poetic. It sounds poetic, so I'm, I'm gonna put it on a shirt because that's what you do with poetry things now. Um, I like the idea of humanity and people coming together. And I even like the idea, uh, I, don't, I don't always like the idea, I don't like, I don't like religion, but I do like the idea of God. Um, I just think that sometimes we box God in a lot, or whatever that may, whatever that may be. Uh, I think humans just kind of do that. We pigeonhole a lot of things. Or we see people and we want to kind of box them in into what makes us comfortable or what, or what we can kind of put a label on. I think we do that across the board with everything. Right, including the religions that we we subscribe to. Um, let's do the art of God joint. When my favorite poet said, "The spoken word was the art of getting to know God for a living," what I heard was, "Art will reveal the reality of God." Spoken word, psalms of today, songs of yesterday, poise, pain, and prose, scripted tablets to Facebook pages, pages of prayer pasted blogs, pontificated, performed pieces of God's agenda. I, I never believed that God had a gender. I think that God is art, purest form of self expression, love, and love with the idea of thus making self creation the, the great I am, finished into a complete sentence sentence structure to conjure images. I don't think that God is a poet. I think that God is poetry. Evolution in haiku. Immaculate conception conjugated by consonants and vowels. The all-knowing, all-spark of alliteration transformed. Transcending formations leads me to think that maybe, maybe my trans fam be trying to get closer to God the way we all are. Like, ain't we all made in the image of God? Ain't poetry all about imagery? I mean, who is anyone to say that the person they see in the mirror isn't the poem they are meant to be? But if God's got a gender, well, then God must have a race. Now, I could race to conclude that God is black and looks like me. But if God looks like me, how can God look like you? I told a white woman I saw God in her. She said she saw the same God in me. I don't, I don't think that God is a painter. I think that God is paint, graffitied portraits of divinity. A mixed media mastermind mastering itself as a craft, crafting neon, neo pastel personalities. A sketch of the future. Visions of a sketchy past. Fingers paint brushing problems on blank paper so we can draw our own conclusions. But listening to our own voices, we sing out segregation. Broken down in the beginning to a sample and a sound bite, remixed into religion, a pale skin and beard. A, a dreadlock rock star prophet, Allah and auto tune, Christ chopped and screwed by man, but, but God ain't no singer. No, 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 God is a song written by dance and vice versa, versed in chorus, choreographed chords by plies, life saving cliches from stepfall change whose measures resemble meteors, whose silent meditations sound like melodies. We started time with a tick tock like metronomes popped in a pulse. Locked us into life, put the world on its axis from a clockwise backspin God. It's a four-part harmony heard from four corners of the earth, an R&B run over a rock ballad solo with a guitar made of stars who simultaneously boom bap the Big Bang Theory. Our creator, whose art is heaven, hallowed be thy frame, thy singdom sum, spun into Genesis. God is art and we are its masterpiece. I saw you move from there to there. What am I looking like on time? You're good, whenever. Cool. You let us know. Okay. It's, it's, it's close to their bedtime, so I'm not gonna, I established that early, I'm not gonna keep you out too late. I've seen some of y'all hit me with the, this joint right here, like a whole ass toddler. <laughs> um, I believe in love. I know that's really corny, and I—I I mean, I agree. It's—it it's, it sounds corny, but I do. Like, I just—I think I want in—in in a perfect world, I just want people to love each other. 
um, you know what I mean, and treat people the way, treat, treat people the way they would like to be treated. <laughs> I know we're always like, you gotta treat people the way you wanna be treated. The way you wanna be treated may be a little different than the way I wanna be treated, and I would like you to treat me the way I would like to be treated. <laughs> Because um, that's kind of what love is. Love is this malleable thing, right? It's not finite, right? There's no real clear definition of it because you could ask each person in here what love looks like for them and they're all going to give you something just a little different, right? There's going to be some similarities, right? But there's going to be something a little, just, just a little different in the way that they want to be loved, right? And it's the reason why God also looks a little different from person to person, religion to religion, belief system to belief system. And that's okay, so in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So when I'm speaking these words, this isn't poetic rhetoric. This is me trying to get back to the sentence from which I came. Love. Love is two or three different more concrete emotions all rolled into one mass combined with flesh and speech to create man, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was love, because God is love. So I love you the way God does, like forever, like no end, because God, love, is infinite. And we were made in this image of infinite love. So in a search to find myself, not only had I never left, but I had been looking in the eye of I and I the entire time, just waiting on me to speak the word so that God in me could be revealed. See, this is self-love. It's what you often need first before you go looking for God in someone else. So here's some questions. Like, like if God sees all, how can love be blind? Or if I'm looking for a true love, does that mean I'm looking for a true God if in fact God is love? Or if God is love and this is true, how can we look up to find God but we fall into love? I mean, when do we learn to separate the two? Or if we make love, have we formed God inside the room? Is this the never before explained immaculate conception of God and in intercourse of universes colliding planet first, emitting bursts of energy so far beyond known to flesh and bone that we put it on a throne? I have only known love to be that powerful. So it changed everything, it even changed the way I pray. Like, dear love, I God you. Guide me as only you could. So many people run from you, mistreat the vessels in which you were contained because they are told to fear God, which makes them fear love. So they go through life never being able to understand God, never being able to feel love. Even church told me to fear God and ask why, how, how do I love you and fear you at the same time? Didn't make sense. So I had to be born again. I was dying to find you. I know so many who have died to find you. And often, we are too far gone. We are so far gone that we can't even see where God is anymore. And this is why we look for love in all the wrong places. So in hopes that everyone, everyone finds their one true God. In love's name I pray. Amen. Amen. So this is a true story. So uh, I get woken up. Woken? Was I woken up? Sure, whatever. Awakened? Language is made up. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> it's, it's made up. Listen, listen. Bling bling and bootylicious were added to the dictionary when I was like 16, okay? <laughs> that gave me no, no faith in the English language after that. None, none at all. Cray cray is in the dictionary. I just need you to know that, okay? That's a real thing that happened in our lifetime. <laughs> I was awakened. I woke up. I was, look, so I woke up, right? <laughs> because there was somebody knocking at the door. This is early, early on a Saturday morning. So I get up. I open the door. It's two very lovely Jehovah's Witnesses. <sighs> <laughs> 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 and so
And so immediately, you know, they start the conversation, right? And they got a, we got a screen door in between us. And I'm like, hey, she's like, they're like, hey, good morning. We wanted to give you this. We wanted to just have a little talk with you. And I'm like, ah, no, I'm good. <laughs> they was like, oh, no, we just wanted to talk for a second. I'm like, ah. And they, they, they lure you in. What they do is they ask a question. They ask a question to get this conversation sparked up. And she says, hey, do you know where God is? And, and listen, I, look, I, know, I, I know what she was looking for, all right? God is, God is inside of us. God lives in us all. God is everywhere. And I did not say any of those things. What I said was, What's bad is I did this earlier when we were rehearsing like several times. And I still don't know better. Like I just don't learn. That the problem is I don't learn. <laughs> what I said instead was God is in jail. <laughs> she's taken aback. And she's like, Oh no, like, <laughs> before you ask, yes, yes, she was. <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> so she's like, oh no, why would you say that? And I say, because cause every brother I know found God while he was locked up. <laughs> every. Every single one. Jesus, Allah, they all, they all locked up. That's where everybody finds God. I know this because my brother was locked up. <laughs> so, that's some first-hand experience. What was, what was? More? No, what? That's not, that is, this is, it's just shitty tape. Like, it's not, it's not God. It's like, you go, <laughs> So this, this story has nothing to do with anything. It's just my favorite story to tell about my mother. So just to show you what type of Christian my mom was. So my mom, and my mom was a diehard Christian to the day she passed, right? Never changed. But she was not the avid churchgoer that she, that she was when we were younger. And this is one of the reasons why. So we're in church. We're in church, and the uh, pastor brings through like a, a, guest, a guest pastor, a guest speaker. And it is this very, very excited man who is like all over the church, just a hooping and hollering kind of pastor, right? Which is not, which is different than the pastor we were, were used to. We, we had the more like kind of chill, more like, you know, soft-spoken. He's a teacher more than a, more than a, a, a reverend, you know what I mean, by traditional standards. But he brought in this pastor who's this, this hooping and hollering, running around the church the whole nine, right? And... To show you what type of, type of person that we're dealing with here, what he has us do, what he has the congregation do, is he was going, he was going to bless everybody. And it's in this church, right, in this three sections, right, there was three separate, you know, parts to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the church. So he goes from section to section blessing everyone. And what he has them do is stand up, he says some words, like a, like a wizard, <laughs> And then he waves his hand. And then we watched row by row of the, per of the people in the, in the congregation fall back into their chairs. I said, you got to be shitting me. <laughs> now listen, at the time, I'm about nine. Uh, and then my brother, my brother is about six years older than me. And, then, and we're sitting in the last section. So we watched this happen twice. Right? And I can see my mother's face mid sermon go from huh to uh. <laughs> my mother was not that type of Christian. <laughs> my mother came in, she, wrote, she writes down the, the scriptures so she can reference later. She goes home, right? She don't do all the extra. He goes to the next section, he has everybody stand up. He, he, uh, 
e pluribus unum, and he just, and he, and he had it. Six semper tyrannis, and he, and he, and he waves. I don't know what, I don't know what he said. You know what I mean? Like it was, you know what I mean? He was speaking in tongues or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like he's, and he just does the thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> whatever, you know what I mean? Whatever, or whatever Harry Potter said. He was, and he did the thing. <laughs> and then, and then the middle section, the second section, they all fall. They all fall. And so then he gets to our section, right? We're the last ones. And, he, and you could feel the don't fucking come over here coming, <laughs> radiating off my mother's body. He gets to us and he's like surveying the whole crowd. And he has us do something a little different. He has everybody stand up and he says, he said, I'm going to do something special with this section. He said, I want you all to hold hands. So we all lock hands, my mother and my brother and then me and then all the people in the pew, we're all, we're all holding hands, long ass little chain link. And he, and he does the thing and he's, he's, he's abracadabra, <laughs> he fucking waves, he waves his hand. And then all the people holding hands, I mean literally, row by row, start falling. And then, it gets right about here. And as soon as that woman that was sitting next to my mother falls, my mother said, yes. <laughs> we did not fall. <laughs> but it didn't stop everyone else. We were, in the middle of the, we were in the middle of the section. Everyone in front of us and everyone behind us all still fell. Just the three lonely ass people standing up it was just me and my mother, my brother, and I. It was the weirdest experience I've ever had in a church ever. It was also the last time we ever went to that church. <laughs> my mother said, what, what in the hell is this? Oh, man. That has nothing to do with the poem I'm about to do. It's just, it's just a fun story to tell about my mother. So... Um, I'm closing out. We are closing out, right? Am I closing out? We are closing out. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> He's like, sure, whatever. <laughs> That's what you say. <laughs> That's not a spell. That's not a blur. You know, it's like carpe diem. You just... <laughs> so, so, so. Um... And talk, so I, look, I'm, I make fun of a lot of things, right? I talk about race, I talk about religion a lot. Um, and I say some things that makes people uncomfortable. Um, and I'm also kind of ridiculous. Uh, but I think, it, I think that um, the beauty in it is that it, it changes people's perspectives, or at least opens you up to some other thought. Um, it does cause you to have some, some uncomfortable moments and some, uh, some uncomfortable conversations that you may take home with you. And it is not easy. It is not easy doing that, right? I could easily get up here and just give you a lot of what you had already hoped to hear. Um, but what's the fun in that, right? How does that change anything? Uh, but, um, and, and to circle back to this last piece, there's a privilege and the ability to do that, to be able to now have uh, these difficult conversations and bring up these very difficult topics that divide us most of the time um, and make light of them and joke or, or write about them and speak about them in, in front of an audience of very different faces uh, and then be able to walk out of here with little to no consequence, right? Not everyone was, is always afforded that. This last piece um, uh, is about one of my favorite artists uh, and the inability to challenge certain types of thought uh, and be safe uh, and feel safe about it. Um, and then people not realizing that not saying certain things and not ruffling feathers, not uh, challenging the status quo, not talking about um, the injustices that exist uh, within the human experience, 
um, not talking about those things, it, it, it's, a, it's survival. It's an act of survival. So for this last piece, uh, I'm going to get some help um, from uh, one of my favorite artists. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Louis Armstrong. Show some love. Come down just a little bit, Marcus. <clears throat> and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I remember when Jim Crow hatched. And in my lifetime, I've seen more burning crosses than I've seen churches. And I've seen more burning churches than I've seen good white Christians. But I never said anything, though. And those revolutionaries in the 60s said, oh, Louis, have been shucking and jiving. But in the 20s and the 30s, we called it making a living. Living to play tomorrow, because what has more life than the music? So I played whatever they asked me to play, and that is how I survived. And I had friends that had been fighting for freedom, found dead in the dead of night, their eyes bulging, face blue, swollen round, inspired the name Blueberry Hill. This South, this South ain't have no use for you unless you could chop down sugar cane or sang. And I was blessed with a style trumpet, a voice these crackers couldn't get enough of. But I smoked like 12 joints a day. Stayed high to avoid the fear of hanging. In a world, in a time, where they could still put nigger on your birth certificate. Killing, killing a Negro won't even ascend in America yet. Seems like you having some trouble with that today. They wear badges now. In the 60s, they wore sheets. When I was a boy, they just wore a smile. Now I'm not proud of all the things I didn't say, but could you imagine how sad the songs would have been if I had sang what I saw then? <clears throat> I see skies of blue. Clouds of white, black bodies burning like candlelight. You know, you cats ain't no different than me. I play the horn, but y'all play the game. Type in your grief behind computer screens. Ain't never took a noose or a bullet in the name of freedom in a country that wants you dead. The most rebellious thing I could do was live and pretend that my music made it better. That is the reality I wanted to believe. The one I sung until the day that I passed. But I lied to myself. What a wonderful... Roscoe and for Marcus and for these lights that tried to steal the show. <laughs>
Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our loyal viewers at home. Thank you for everybody behind the scenes. Carlos, Andrea, Paul, Billy, Charlie, Dave, Danny, Annie, Taylor, Tom. And a huge thank you to our in-studio audience. Thank you for coming out and supporting these uh, local art tonight. And some music, local music. You wanna do this? And Reese, of course. Reese, it's not on the script because. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's not on the script. Okay. No. <laughs> Thank you to our cameramen, too, for harassing us. Um, so the show can be found on uh, Shaco Sessions Live YouTube channel. So please watch it again and share it. It's very special. It's great to have you here, and it's great to have you for uh, the rest of time on YouTube, too. So now, without further ado, that is our show for the night. Thank you, and that is a wrap. Have a good night, everybody. Woo! <laughs>